to the Archive Room podcast. First of all, I'm Judith Lay and I'm very pleased to find you waiting for me at the door to the Archive Room, the place where we keep stories of island life in years gone by, told by the people who were there. So, come on in. Sit down and make yourself comfortable and let's listen to this week's selection. The Manx language isn't something that we've talked about very much in the archive room. So that's our first stop this week with a fascinating conversation that I hope shows how things have actually improved over the years. Victor Neal, CBE, was a Manx politician who during his distinguished career was Education Minister and Speaker of the House of Keys. He was born in 1918, and when we first met him in an earlier programme, he painted a wonderful picture of his childhood when days were never long enough for all the fun a youngster could have, growing up in Douglas around the busy harbour in a town full of great characters. Today, Victor is back, this time with his wife Thelma, and with David Collister, they're chatting about the Manx language in general and some of the words and phrases that are part of their everyday vocabulary. And as you listen, it's well worth remembering that this conversation was recorded about 25 years ago. And so, let's welcome Thelma and Victor Neal, who tell David they also have another name. The Douglas Botties. Where Douglas Botties? Botties. Botties, yes. No idea how it originated, but that's what uh, we were always known as, the Douglas Botties. My father had Manx-speaking parents who also spoke, spoke English, but they wouldn't speak the Manx to the children. Mm. But I think my father must have had sharp ears because he picked up a fair amount, yeah. you see. So a yeah. few words that we picked up in our time with Dad, you see. Well, my mum used this one, and it was a slew. I had a brother, and she'd say, now, just let's see if your slew is right, you see. Your hair? Your hair. I used to think it was the parting, but I was talking to Bernard Kane, and he said, no, there's a joiner's tool called a slew, and that was for smoothing rather like a plane. And so he said that would mean that the hair was smooth. A brock, which uh, means you've made a bit of a mess. I went up to see an aunt of mine who was married to my father's brother, and she asked me to cut the bread while I'm left-handed. And she just said, Oh, will you cut the bread, please, Thelma? Well, I should have told you that I was kithigy to be kithig. It's left-handed. Is it? Yes. I can't crook bread yet. And so uh, she came in and she said, Dear me, dear me, she said, You've made an awful brock of the loaf, she said. <laughs> that was in circulation when I was a kid as yes. well, I think. Yeah. Yes, brock. Well, now, and Risty, if something had just gone off, you know, in the days before fridges and that, bacon or butter, yeah. we used to go risty. Well, it meant it had gone over slightly, it had gone off. Then the zhauzhik, oh. that's a woman, a scolding woman, a woman with a sort of sharp tongue, uh. yes. Father McKillia, that's often used, you know. What? Oh, you're all Father McKillia, you're all... In a bit of a mess, you know. I thought you meant a Catholic priest for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Father McKillia. Father McKillia, I don't know how you spell it. I suppose the Killia is, is the same as <laughs> the name. But Father, I don't know. I've just done it phonetically, yeah. which I think would be a good idea for your news announcers oh, because, yes. you know, they do put their foot in it with us Manxies, you know. Well, what's the worst thing well, they've done lately? say Dalby instead of Dorby. And Ballarack one day, oh dear, dear, dear. Ballarack, that was desperate, wasn't it? Yeah, that yeah. was desperate. So I feel, you know, and the likes of the farm, which is always when the um, Mills Baldwin thing, Cam Locke was coming over regularly. Yeah. Well, it's Cam Lurk. I told them it was Cam Lurk, and yeah, Terry Kringle's always stuck to that. Yes, but then they seem to be, yes. there seem to be two two pronunciations. Yes. And it's the same as Glen Faber and Glen Faber. Yes. You can't be yes. sure you're right. Well, let Vic have a little turn now. Right, well, I should not I... use the word blatherskite in connection with any politician at all, should I? <laughs> well, uh, it refers to a few, but... Uh... <laughs> 
the common ones would be trade de lure, wouldn't they, I suppose, yeah. time and off. Of course, in, in the folklore, we've, we've had all this stuff coming to us as children, more they do, and, and for no reason, all that sort of thing. Yes, well. they're something that everybody should know about, and normally they get the pronunciation right. But a story about uh, my brother, he was living down at Bognarigas, and he had a, a boat, and he christened it the Fenodri, and he was keeping it in a, a marina there, and when he was coming in, the fellow on the side would be shouting to all the others by their boat names, but when he would come to try and pronounce Fenodri, he used to just shout out, Come in, Mr. Neil. <laughs> There's glister. To give someone glister means to give them a good telling off, to oh. give them glister. There was one, Gerud, someone that was in a real Gerud, and they were in a real fix, you know, I suppose they'd got everything, dishes piled up and everything going, and so they were in a bit of a Gerud. My mother used to use that. Yes, a Gerud. Yeah. It's a good expressive one, isn't it? And the other one, of course, we, we use so often is Yissa, and I can't really find any proper definition of that. No, it's one we've used uh, ever since we were kids, and it's just like the saying, how are you doing, boy, but you say, how are you doing, Yissa? Will you be having pritters and heron? Well, we used to have them, yes. My father worked till about 8 o'clock at night, so on a Friday night he'd come home and just have a cup of tea and then go back to the shop to work and then mum would have a big these big iron pots you know with potatoes in the skins she'd scrub the skins and you have those and heron put on top and you cut onion and soak that in vinegar and that was a meal on a friday night with good butter on the spuds you know yes (laughs) I, i remember somebody coming to our cottage at Bolafria when I was a kid who had the very same thing and not only ate the potatoes and the meat off off the fish but the bones as well. Yeah (laughs) and stockfish. Would you remember the stockfish hanging outside grocer's shops? It was dried cod really and you soaked it and then it was still salty after all that. Now, let's see, where do we go from here now? Over the bridge, yes. Yes. Well, it's a different dialect altogether over the bridge. Yes, well, uh, this is where people get a bit confused when they talk about over the bridge these days. They think it's the ferry bridge down near Balasala, but uh, actually the the expression over the bridge means going over the stone bridge at the top of Douglas Harbour because that was the road to the south of the island. That's the old Castletown Road is known as now. But when you were going over that bridge, you were going to the south. So the people from the south were the ones from over the bridge. What about fat as a mollig? As fat as a mollig, well, that is the float that they used in these ships in days gone by to stop them banging against the next boat in Mm -hmm. port. And they were bladders of animals, presumably pig or sheep, and they would be blown up, and so they would be as fat as a, a mollig then. Also, the scutch, and another word, I'll give you a good scutch if you don't behave yourself, yeah. you see, to a child who'd be naughty. A spidig, I believe, was the smallest in, say, a litter of pigs or cats or dogs would be... Well, you'd uh, refer to a small child as a a spithig. A little spithig of a thing. Now, I've used this. I don't know whether it's Manx or not. A drillain, someone that's dreamy and doesn't get out of her own way. Uh But there's another one as well, ligamathre. That's got to be more guttural, ligamathre. It's someone who just lets the hours go by, you know, again, laid back, I Mm. suppose, really. Uh And strugan, of course, you know what that means, don't you? No. Well, when you're scraping your feet along, you're not picking your feet on, you're just strugan your feet along the ground. Gull is gargan, as we say, going and grumbling. Well, when you were the Speaker of the House of Keys, of course, they were referring to you in Manx there, and the, the, there's uh, Meister Lauder, and now uh, more terms are creeping into Timwald, mainly from Peter Cowan and Hazel Hannum. Yeah, well, I, I think they, there they want to concentrate more on the English, because uh, everybody will understand them then, yeah. because it's bad enough understanding some of them when they're speaking English.
Now, there's still quite a few expressions in your generation, but uh, how long can they hold, do you think? Well, as long as we keep saying them, if we're not careful, it's Manx Radio, and if you're going to let it keep going, then everything will get anglified. So you try your best to keep the Manx flavour going. So you've got full marks. Oh, right. <laughs> but you're right, it will be lost. In, I mean, language it does will. develop, but it does. it's nice to hang on to these things, isn't I it? I think so. Yeah. I'll just have to say to both of you, good am I, if it's right. Evi, David. Radio Thelma and Victor Neal chatting some 25 years ago with David Collister about the Manx language. And happily, thanks to our present Manx language development officer, Ruth keggin Gell and many other Manx speakers over those last 25 years, the security and the future of the Manx language is assured. Now we're heading down south. If you've ever visited the Sound Cafe or walked around in that area, I wonder if you've ever gazed at the Calf of Man and wondered what it would be like to live there. Not just visit it, to actually live there. Well, we're about to get a fascinating insight. But the man who's going to tell the story really didn't have any choice about being there. He's Leslie Garrett, who was born in 1932. But let's begin by listening to Leslie telling us a little about his father, Robert, who grew up in Selby in the early 1900s. My father lived down the Clannock Road, and the actual place that they lived in was actually a cow house to start with, and then Kelly Brothers Kirk Michael thatched it, and then 20 years afterwards they lifted it. Before that, my father, Uncle Alfie, Uncle Henry, lived in the hen house. At really? the side of it. Uncle Alfie lived in a galvanised shed alongside. And I've got a photograph of him when he come home from the Navy, outside with his vest on, having a shave. That's how they brought up. Now you wouldn't see it, but I've got a photograph somewhere off the actual cottage. Mm. It's still on the same angle down the Clannock Road. It's the third building down right. on the Clannock Road, and it's right on the side of a lane there. And that's where they lived. Robert Garrett started his working life on farms. In the mid-1930s, he saw a job advertised for farm work in the south of the island, only to discover, when he'd got it, that the farm in question was on the Calf of Man. And that was how Robert Garrett became the steward of the Calf of Man, and in 1936 moved there with his wife and young family. Leslie Garrett, who was about three and a half at the time of the move, takes up the story in conversation with David Collister. He was Robert Garrett, he was a steward, three children. I was the oldest, then Michael, then Maureen, and then the other girl that was born on the calf was Violet. Yeah. And the, the certificate I've just shown you, that was Kathleen. That so was there were she- two born on the calf? Yes, two. And no doctors. Where's the midwife? My father. When he was asked how did he know how to bring a child in, like, yeah, and because yeah. he tied the biblical cord himself yeah. with a navy knot, apparently, <laughs> with a, a figure of eight in, in <laughs> yeah. and cut it. And he said, well, the birth of a cow, he said, was nine months, and he said he didn't think there was any difference. Yeah, so that yeah. that's how he put it, but uh, when people were reading it, he thought he was pretty crude, <laughs> like, but that's how he put it. So you'd be there from about three, three and a half to near on seven years seven, of age. Seven, yeah. Well, what happened with your education, then? My education wasn't really so good, to tell you the truth. And I say, and I finished before my 14th birthday. But you couldn't go to school from the calf, could no. you? No, oh no. Your f- mother and father wouldn't have time to teach you much, either. Not really, not, not really. The only thing my mother was teaching me was songs and lullabies. Oh, right. I, I knew, and they're old too, the yeah. lullabies. Like, mm-hmm. well, at the end of the programme, I might give you one. <laughs> I look forward to that. Now, you'd be too young to get, remember all the details of this, but what sort of buildings would be on the calf then? We know about the farmhouse and presumably there'd be outbuildings with that. Well, there was the, the stable, which was more or less alongside the kitchen where you come out for the kitchen, mm. and then looking square off at the cow houses were down the left-hand side, and then it was like a, a square yard. In the left-hand corner where you went out the square yard, there was the place where all the batteries were, you know, from the windmill charging the batteries there. There was a windmill? 
Yeah, and there was also a corn thrasher there as well. One of the old circular Yeah, mills. with a horse going round. That would be out of use though, would it? No, that was in use was there. It? More or less, yes, in was use it? when my dad was there, yes. And then you went through the cow house at the side of the thrashing mill and that's where the horses were going round. Yeah. And if you go there today, you can see that stone. And that was there. And then the hen house was alongside of that. And then just down off that was where all the ch- batteries were charged. You're telling me here then we've got a working farm, you've got a corn mill that's getting used, so yeah. there must have been corn, there must have been then the means of reaping it. There's a binder on, I've got photographs of that. That was presumably there before your father got there, was it? I would say so, but I think yeah. it would belong to Mr Popperwell. Oh, he was the previous owner, but whether he had somebody working for him then, I have no idea. Wasn't there also an old car? There was an old car there that my father used to tinker about. I don't think he ever got it going, <laughs> but right. he was always tinkering with it, you know. I always remember I would be about six or so six and a half, and he would stand me up on a box... He made me put my fingers on the plugs and he would be turning and he would be going, tut, 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 there's no, <laughs> nothing that happened in here. And then he'd see my finger, he'd give me a shock and then I wouldn't go back, I'd go running in the house. <laughs> so your father then was doing all the farm work on his own? Then? More or less, yes. There's nobody, else, except when he got uh, his brother to come in the summertime, maybe to help him with oh. the cutting off the corn. And He'd have a horse then? There was at least three because he, he had to take two up on the plough on the top. Now, how did you get your supplies then? My father used to go once a fortnight across, and uh, I can remember on one occasion, that, and this is when the, the motorboat that was on the calf, which was left there by Popperwell, it got knocked out of the boathouse by mm. a big storm, and we lost the motorboat. The last year, I think, my father was rowing. We were a fortnight or three weeks without food. Of course, there was plenty of eggs and yes. stuff like that, but one of the things my father did, I don't know whether you remember, but you know how you get this stuff called uvica? It's like a cornflake, but it's what you feed cattle and the hens oh, and oh, all that. Yeah. And it's, it, it's a shape like cornflake. Right. My father put that in boiling water to get all the the brand out of it yeah. and he made that into a, a, a like a thin cake and that's what we had <laughs> yeah to go with our egg or whatever there was nothing yeah. else was the running water there or not yes there was i think it come out of a big tank the rain water yeah it's and electric to- Electricity. Electric was on as well. That was caused by the, the big windmill and generator. Oh, you generated yeah, your own? In 1938, oh, yeah. the blades all broke on that in 1938, so oh, yeah. we just had oil lamps to start with. And what did you do then for power? Just only oil lamps? Just and oil lamps, yeah. yeah. And then there was also a telephone on, telephone was lamps there? to start with. That went in the storm, so after that there was no links. But when you come to look at it, when he did go on there, he really didn't have any experience of um, electricity or boatmanship. It yeah. was only like Ned Madrill that gave him all that when he went on, and he was yeah. he was very good to Dad. He came on quite a lot, apparently. He came on and showed him different things. You wouldn't get many visitors, would you? Occasionally. My mother used to do an odd tea and all. There would be occasional visitors mm. brought in, yes. I don't know who done that. I think it might be Madrill or somebody that done that. Oh, right. It certainly wasn't my father, like he mm. didn't didn't have any time to take the boat and go across and whatnot. I think it was uh, probably like today, trips brought in. You were telling me a a marvellous thing about a horse that had decided to eat some green corn. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, the brewet, like, which is a young corn about two inches high, and my uncle was over at the time, and the horse was lying sort of on its side, couldn't get up because it was full of wind. What, it had been eating the corn? Eating the corn, eating the brew it, and it was my father come out and saw it there, and then he got my uncle to sit on it, and he jabbed it with the pitchfork, and it was running around the blooming <laughs> field, yeah. making the noises. <laughs> <laughs> Dispatching its wind, was it? It, it, it was quite loud, <laughs> and I can remember it, and it was a la- bit of a laugh, I think, to me. And Uncle Henry was petrified on the horse. <laughs> And then another occasion, my father brought the horse in uh, to give it water, tied it up a bit, and my mother was in the in the kitchen, and I'd come out, and I was hanging to the horse's leg. I'd be about four. Of course, my mother come out, shouted, and my father just said, oh, leave him, he'll be all right. The horse will not touch him. And sure enough, I walked away, had enough of holding the horse's leg and come away, and, and then I got my bottom down. You didn't get a kick from the horse? Though. No, nothing. And another occasion... <laughs> 
my father goes for the provisions. And uh, I followed him down, unknowns to him, goes down to the sound end, and was playing in the water there, and the tide coming in. So my Uncle Henry was there that time, but I got scutched, <laughs> scutched with a stick. <laughs> and then the ship that went aground there called the Mary Borough. I don't really know whether that went aground while we were on or while it was already there, but I can remember him bringing a box about 18 inches by a foot high, uh -huh. and it had t two sets of drawers in it and a lid that opened like that. Now, all in the top was, was the needles, the stitching, and everything, iodine, gentry of violet, all that in it. So when that was brought and any of us got a cut, <laughs> my mother wouldn't say go and get the medicine chest, she would say go and get the Mary Borough. Yeah. That's what she said. Every time that somebody was cut, she'd give us a dab of the gentry violet or the iodine, yeah. which we didn't like. It was <laughs> probably strong stuff in them days. Uh, and that's what she called it, the Mary yeah. Borough. That was off the boat. Uh, that was in yeah. the captain's thing in the boat or the skipper of the boat. My father brought ropes up, block and tackle, and lots of that stuff was buried up in ba Balamanic Hackett. When we had to move from there, mm. and my mother went into the guest home, all that stuff we had to get rid of. So we, my brother got a digger, oh. <laughs> dug a big hole and buried it all in it. Your mother must have been quite a tough woman to be able to live and work down there in the calf. Well, she was really. She came from Yarmouth. She was of a seafaring family. In her younger days, her father was a, a, a sailor. I think he eventually was in the Royal Navy and then he jumped ship in New Zealand and then he, he was pardoned for the First World War and came back and he was on sailing ships after that. And then because of the conditions, with I think there was five of a family all together and he was at sea that often, my mother's mother ended up on the gin. Because oh. at that time, my mother had to go into a home. She went in a Catholic home. And that's how Mother learnt all her bits and pieces, was from the nuns. Mm. So she was there until 18, which they asked her then, you know, you'd get the chance of becoming a nun if you wanted it. My mother didn't. She mm. went into t domestic work. Yeah. And she came to the Isle of Man at 19, and that's when she met Dad. Yeah. She was a barmaid in, in the Sulby Glen. Wasn't nothing my mother couldn't do, but she did tell me on one occasion that she'd done something when she was in the nun's place got into trouble and they forgot about it and she was left standing from 8 o'clock at night till 8 o'clock the next morning in, yeah. the, in the hall really? and she said it was hard going there she said I don't know how the children would cope today she said if they had the discipline that was no, given there course. by the nuns yeah. she said they were quite strict but mm. my mother she could do anything she also could sing lullabies this is one of them and from what I know is very old and it starts Gentle moon that gives us light Through the darkness of the night Will you kindly tell us, pray Where you go to in the day In your starry nest Do you ever rest? Good night, Mr. Moon I shall have to go and leave you. Good night, Mr. Moon. Come again and see me soon. And when you're asleep, through the window pain you'll peep. you wake up and call out Good night, Mr. Moon. And Leslie Garrett was absolutely right. Good night, Mr. Moon is a lullaby from the early 1900s. What a precious memory. And I'll have more memories, traditions, fascinating and funny stories to share with you when we meet at the archive room door at the same time next week. But for now, let's turn off the lights and close the door. Don't forget, you can find all the programmes in the previous series of The Archive Room by subscribing for free to The Archive Room podcasts at manxradio.com or via your usual podcast provider. I'm Judith Lay saying thank you for listening and wishing you a very good evening. The sound of your